Hello, everyone, and welcome to Kingston Christian Fellowship. Thank you so much for joining us today. I want to get right into it today. I want to talk about uh, the power of God. So if you have your Bible with you, turn to Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2. I'm going to read from verse 1 uh, and just read uh, bits and pieces of the first half of Acts chapter 2. It says, When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues or other languages as the Spirit enabled them. Skip ahead to verse 12. It says this about a, a particular crowd that was there. It says, amazed and perplexed, they asked one another, what does this mean? Some, however, made fun of them and said they have had too much wine. Verse 14, then Peter stood up with the eleven, raised his voice and addressed the crowd. Fellow Jews and all of you who live in Jerusalem, let me explain this to you. Listen carefully to what I say. These men are not drunk as you suppose. It's only nine in the morning. No, this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and your daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams, etc., etc. Uh, regurgitating the uh, the prophecy from uh, from Joel there. I want to take a quick look at this passage because uh, I feel that uh, this book, you know, the book of Acts is extremely important. You know, Paul writes many places in the New Testament and he talks about principles and ways of Christian living. But this passage is so incredibly important because of what it's attached to. This is part of the fruit and the outworking of the cross of Jesus. The greatest event in human history led to uh, this passage, the birth of the church, Christ with us, uh, you know, the, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, the way uh, that God would, the strategy that God would use to impact the world with the gospel and impact people with himself. The importance of this passage cannot be overlooked. You know, we read at the end of Acts 2 that 3,000 were added in a day, and daily after that, people were coming into the faith. It's so important to recognize the impact that the Holy Spirit makes, that there are insights and strategies and things here that God is trying to communicate to us and things that we need to participate in and, and be a part of, right? Uh, Acts chapter 1, you know, it says when the power comes on you, when the Holy Spirit comes on you and endues you with power, he says, you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Now, I don't know if you have it in your heart to make an impact or how big of an impact you want to make, but this is the key. This is what Jesus himself said would, would make an impact to the furthest regions, the ends of the earth, would touch the furthest reaches of mankind. It's this right here. He's talking about the power that is available in the Holy Spirit. Do you want your ministry to expand and grow? Do you want to have a large impact for the kingdom? This is how it's going to be done. Look, I understand that this can be a controversial passage. We all read this differently. I don't know about you, but I've never seen tongues of fire. But just because I've never seen it or participated in this specific kind of you know, manifestation, that doesn't mean it's not real. That doesn't mean this kind of power isn't for us. That doesn't mean we can just throw it out and be on our merry way and try to do things ourselves. So today, you know, I want to address any fear of God's power or any discomfort or lack of trust with God's power being expressed because it's so important that we journey forward in the manner that God has laid out for us. Amen. <laughs> Look, verse 12 says this, it says, amazed and perplexed. Have you ever been amazed before? Have you ever been perplexed before? Now, have you, have you ever been both at the same time? <laughs> 
amazed and perplexed. They asked one another, what does this mean? Now look, as humans, we tend to try to avoid pain, right? We try to avoid discomfort. We tend to avoid things we don't understand. And we definitely try to avoid situations in which we don't have control. I've got some good news for you today. God will take you out of your comfort zone. I don't know if you've ever prayed the prayer, you know, God, I want to grow. God, I, I want to do something larger than me. God, I, I want to, I've, I've got a vision to be up here, but we understand that growth is what it's going to take to get there. Well, growth takes stretching and enlargening takes stretching. And maybe you've prayed the prayer already. I know I have, you know, God stretch me, or you just prayed the prayer, God, I, I'll do whatever you ask. Part of that is growth. Part of that is stretching. That means that we are going to encounter things beyond ourselves. And part of building a trust relationship with Jesus is that we've got to face situations in which we don't have the control. I love this verse 12, though, right? Because it says that these people were perplexed. It's almost as if they said, you know what? We can't figure this out. Our, our brains can't filter and register and process what it is that's going on here. Uh, but it also says, they asked this question, you know, what does this mean? So even though their brain couldn't figure it out, it didn't scare them away. Now, how different do you think that is from maybe the North American church that seems to build their religion mainly intellectually, cerebrally with their brains, right? The power of God here in this case, it confused their, their brains, but it attracted their spirits. They were intrigued. What does this mean? I want to know more. And the truth is, is that God's power should be attractive. It shouldn't be something that we're scared of or that pushes us away, but that actually draws us in. God's going to put us in situations in which we must exercise faith, even when our brains are perplexed. <clears throat> Excuse me. Now, I want to talk about a subject that is a little sensitive, and I joke because I want to talk about seeker sensitivity. It's a term that's come up in the past 10, 20, 30 years, uh, and, you know, there are many environments that have changed their approach because they're afraid to offend people, especially people that might be unfamiliar to the faith. But whenever, you know, we try to control the power of God in the service, we actually hinder the agent of change because the power is what's needed for transformation. Power is the agent that brings transformation. Tangible power in the room is something that your spirit feels even if your brain can't comprehend it. And sometimes our flesh needs to be offended so that it'll get out of the way. And sometimes our brains need to be offended so that our hearts and our spirits can engage. You know, Romans 10 says that if you confess with your mouth and you believe in your heart. It doesn't say if you confess with your mouth and you believe in your brain or you believe in your mind. It says if you believe in your heart, which means the seed of faith and the seed of belief is actually your heart. It's not your brain. See, God never intended that we live a rational Christianity, that we need to figure everything out to believe it, that we need to figure everything out to participate in it, right? The Bible says we live by faith not by sight, not by what we can rationally process, see, or understand. And so, you know, seeker-sensitive places, they, they end up appealing to the mind. They end up appealing to reason. And the problem with this is that we then develop disciples that must rationalize everything. If they don't understand it, they won't accept it. We develop a people that struggle with trust and faith because they've got to understand everything before they respond to God. We develop a people whose faith is based on the strength of their mind instead of the new heart that God has given them, the new creation realities. Seeker sensitivity and the power of God. I want you to notice here in verse 14, and, and I read it to you intentionally. Look, uh, let me read it again. Look and see who it is that Peter actually preaches to after this Acts 2 experience. It says, then Peter stood up with the eleven raised his voice and addressed the crowd. He addressed the crowd. See, Peter didn't stand up and address the church. Peter stood up and addressed the crowd. 
Many preachers address the church to try to control the power of God instead of address the people to explain the power of God. See, Peter didn't tell the church to stop expressing the power. He told the crowd how to participate and experience the power. We cannot remove the very agent of change from our services or from our ministry or from our lives because we're scared of a lack of control or scared of offending people. Uh, you know, I, I want you to notice the order of events that happens here. The power comes and then the preaching follows. I love this, right? It, it wasn't rationalizing your brain into an experience. It was having an experience with God and then having it explained to you after, right? I, I think of Saul of Tarsus, right? He was impacted on the road uh, by the power of God first, knocked him right off, right? Sitting on his butt and then God starts to speak and explain what it is that's going on. We need to be a people that are able to position our hearts to say, God, whatever you want and trust him to lead us without our brains judging whether we want it or not. And the good news is, is that he's already given us examples like Acts chapter two, Acts chapter one, all the examples in the Bible, um, you know, John the Revelator in the book of Revelation and all the prophets in the Old Testament, uh, you know, Isaiah's encounter and all these incredible things in which the power of God is a blessing uh, and is so wonderful, it's so helpful for us, it assists us, and it's something we've been made for and born for, and it should be natural for our uh, our spirits to engage in and participate. Look, I've already mentioned, <coughs> excuse me, I've already mentioned that life transformation, it takes power. Paul says, my preaching wasn't with wise and persuasive words, but with a demonstration of the Spirit's power. See, the church has attempted to remove the very thing that is needed for authentic salvation, the power. And in our concern of offending people, we have restricted the very thing that causes change. The very thing Paul says is needed is the thing that seeker sensitivity is trying to remove, or at least trying to holster. Uh, trying to uh, diminish in, in some way, right? I heard a preacher say once that Acts chapter 2 is the first service that the Holy Spirit had complete control, and many have been trying to control him ever since. You know, when people in our services, at least the services here, you know, when they are being ministered to by the Lord, we're very careful how we how we handle that. Um, you know, there's such a concern about the flesh and such a concern about it not being authentic. And I just have to say that, you know, distraction, uh, because that's a big word, right? It's a distraction. That person's being a distraction. Well, you know what? The authentic work of God can distract you. Thank God that what, what he did here in Acts 2 was a distraction because uh, it was important for people to see what it was that was going on. We want the power of God to make a difference. We want God's power to be noticed. An authentic work of God can distract you, yes, in a church service. Passion and joy, they draw attention, but that doesn't mean that it's flesh and it doesn't mean that it's not authentic. So you can't judge a manifestation by distraction because the church was never meant to be a library. There's a record in the gospels of Jesus at the solemn assembly. Uh, you know, if it's, if you wanna know what the culture of that service was like, it's right there in the name. It was a solemn assembly and Jesus carrying the church in his heart knew what his intention for the church was. Apparently the solemn assembly was a little too solemn because if, if you remember right, what Jesus did is he stands up, stands up in the middle of the service, right? He's just in the crowd with everybody else. He stands up. You know what he says? Bible records that he says in a loud voice, is anybody thirsty? Jesus wasn't into the solemn assembly. He didn't think the church was supposed to be a library where you couldn't make any noise. Church should be a celebration. 
you know, I often think our church services should probably look more like sporting events where people are excited to be there and they write signs and they, you know, all this sort of stuff, right? That there's expression. So when we talk about hindering people in church or, or shutting people down that are experiencing God, I tell you, in the fear of the Lord, I stand and say, heaven forbid I ever make a wrong call and stop an authentic encounter with God. What would happen if I put the brakes on God or put restrictions on his work in our church? Far too many churches in North America have already done that. How do you think God responds when we resist him and resist his work, when we resist his power? We end up with churches that turn to religion. It becomes about the words on the page because the presence can't be found. You know, manifestations of a supernatural God give proof that God is real. It's a simple statement. Manifestations of a supernatural God give proof that there is a God and that God is real. Again, rationalizing people into salvation isn't primarily what God intended. People's minds may be impacted by information, but their spirits are impacted by power. And we had a guest speaker last week and he was teaching about Jesus being both Savior and Lord further on in Acts 2. Being both Savior and Lord. And, you know, we, we love we love God being Savior. You know, we love Jesus being Savior. He saved us. That's so wonderful. Sometimes we have trouble with him being Lord, especially in our, our culture nowadays, our culture of autonomy. We have trouble with authority figures, uh, with following people. Uh, we have trouble with discipline, with just being uh, taught on healthy ways to live and healthy ways to be, you know. Uh, and so, you know, Jesus says, Lord, it, it's important to experience him as that. I got to say, you know, he's the kindest, most gentlest, most wonderful person. He's an honor to serve. Every thought towards you, every action, every question he asks is about your health and well-being to bring you into the fullness of love, joy, and peace and healing, you know. It's an honor to serve him as Lord. It's the way things were meant to be. It's not oppressive. It's freedom. Knowing Jesus as Lord and following his leading is, is nothing but freedom. But look, a powerless church doesn't represent a powerful God. When someone experiences God's power and the magnitude of it, there's no question that Jesus should be Lord. When you experience someone like him in all of his fullness, there's no question that he's the King of Kings and he's the Lord of Lords. When we reject his power in our lives and reduce him to words on a page, then he is no longer in control. And, you know, sometimes we make decisions that oppose what God actually wants to do in our lives. Sometimes we don't follow his leading, but we step into his place and make decisions for him. Now, look, it's not it's not about being God, but we sometimes end up taking on his role in our lives by making decisions that are actually his to make. Uh, you know, we make decisions in places where we just need to be uh, submitting to his lordship and let him lead us in the healthy way that he does. Again, you know, it's being in the place of making decisions for God. Remember, he is the head of the church and the one who decides its direction and growth. And we cannot let ourselves take over his role. You know, Peter had this kind of encounter right in the Bible. It's hard to forget this passage where Jesus says, you know, get behind me, Satan, speaking to Peter. Peter, in, in the honesty of heart, I believe, you know, um, Jesus starts explaining, this is what's going to happen. Uh, this is what I'm going to do uh, and all this sort of stuff. And Peter says, no, Lord, that'll never happen to you. And all of a sudden, even if it is out of the goodness of his heart, Peter is trying to stand in the place of God and direct what's going to happen. Uh, Jesus is the one leading and standing in peter's place we just need to say okay lord your will be done not my will be done i may be perplexed my may my brain may not understand it i may not understand it but whatever your will is god is uh is the way we're gonna go we, you know we can't let any discomfort or personal opinion let us direct what god should be directing i want to leave you with this today and it's second timothy 3 5 and it's 
it's a verse again, you know, in the fear of the Lord, you just read it and you say, you know, describes um, people uh, forming and, and shaping this thing. And the term the Bible uses is a form of godliness, but denying its power. It's a form of godliness, but denies its power. Our church cannot be just a form of godliness. It can't just use the name of God, but deny the authentic power and presence of God. We need to accept all that he is and all that he said and all that he's given us. And, you know, Acts 2 is part of the Bible. And wherever you stand today on Acts 2, I'm praying for you. I'm praying that you can make your way through it and position your heart to say, wow, God, you wrote it. You did it. So I need to get on board with it. I can't let my brain hold me back. I can't let my brain be a stumbling block. I can't let my brain be something that hinders me from the fullness of God being expressed in and through my life. Look, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you will be my witnesses, Jesus says, to Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Look, today the power of God is your friend. It's an enormous blessing in your life and it will help you accomplish the purposes of God in your life. You don't need to be scared of it. You don't need to feel uncomfortable around it. You've been made for it, born for it. He is your father and he is um, he is equipping us and pushing us forward into the fullness of him to accomplish his purposes and to see a great harvest in the season. Look, the power of God is incredible. It is so wonderful and so good. May it bless you. May it flow over you right now. May it fill your life. May it accomplish everything that God has in his heart and may it accomplish all the desires of your heart. May the power of God go forth in our churches across North America and across the world. And uh, let's see the power of God release the glory of God cover the earth as the waters cover the sea. Thank you so much for joining us today. God bless you and we'll see you again next time.